You might not know this about Kate, but when she was younger, she used to compete nationally in gymnastics. So as she comes and backflips onto the stage, would you give her a very warm welcome as Kate comes to speak to you? You are so naughty. <laughs> Shall we pray? Lord, you are amazing, and we want to learn about you, and we want to love you more. And we want to learn how to do this life well. So we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would have your way, as we sung earlier, and that you would speak to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. I wonder if you struggle with fear in any area of your life. The reading today is written to a bunch of Christians who... We're going through some seriously extreme circumstances. At the time, Roman Emperor Nero was persecuting Christians, and many of these Christians had been rejected by their families. Many of these Christians were being pursued by the authorities, and yet they continue to follow Jesus. And Peter, who was friends with Jesus and has been through similar persecution, writes to them to encourage them, to tell them how to make the most of what they're going through and that the Holy Spirit is with them. And the Holy Spirit also, through the Holy Spirit, Peter's also talking to us and teaching us how we can live this life free from fear. The reading for today is 1 Peter 3, verse 12 to the end. And it should come up on the screens. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated, but... In your heart, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an account of the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if suffering should be God's will than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey. When God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight people, were saved through water and baptism, which this prefigured now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Amen. I have a friend who is terrified of pigeons. She lives in London, and if you've ever been to London, there's a lot of pigeons. She can't walk on the same side of the pavement as a pigeon. She freaks out whenever she encounters a pigeon and sort of wafts, oh, that's my bracelet gone. You can pick that off for me. <laughs> wafts her handbag at them whenever she sees them. She's often late for things because she encounters pigeons. In this passage, it's helpful to recognize that there are helpful fears and crippling, unhelpful fears. If there's a fire, children need to learn that that is dangerous, that they shouldn't touch it. That is a helpful fear. Fear of our God is a good fear. He is holy and mighty and righteous. And that is a reverence, a respectful fear for him. That's good. But most fears are unnecessary and crippling. If you've got an exam 
it is natural to fear, right? But whether or not we choose to let that fear own us, that is a choice. And it's that choice that Peter is talking about here when he says, do not fear. In the time that Peter is writing, Christians are being persecuted by Nero. And this is barbaric persecution. This was scary. They had a right to be afraid. They had a right to fear. But Peter is saying, this fear doesn't rule over you. You rule over the fear. I've called this talk fearless. I think that looked really good on Instagram tomorrow. Fearless. Because I have a dream. I have a dream that HTBB will be one of the most courageous, bold churches in the world for Jesus. That we will fear nothing that cripples us because we understand the power of our God. I'm terrified of cockroaches. I hate them, the way they scuttle about on those little legs and they just generally look really mean. I hate them. What do you fear? Do you have fears? What are they? Heights, dengue, rejection, getting a B grade. Do you ever get intimidated? God wants us to be free from the fears that cripple us and limit us and stop us doing what we really want to do and stop us being who we really want to be. I want to be fearless in every area of my life. But how? How do we free ourselves of these fears so we can enjoy life to the full? How do we become a fearless people who only fear God, and don't fear what people think about us, and don't fear what people say about us, and don't fear what happens to us. How do we become a fearless people who don't fear sickness, who don't even fear death? Well, as Miles looked at last week, and as Peter reminds us so beautifully in this reading today, we're not to focus on the how, we're to focus on the who. Many years ago, I worked for a company, an events company, and they would run the biggest showbiz events in town. And this particular event, I was on registration, guest registration. Um, It was a VIP birthday party. All the stars were there in their gowns in this beautiful building, the V&A Museum in London. And we were told that we had to be really strict with registration. They had to give us their names, we had to mark them off on the the guest list before they could enter. But the problem was, a lot of these celebrities were really famous. And I know nothing about celebrities. And so when I asked them their name, they were slightly offended that I didn't already know it. They kind of looked at me with that look, don't you know who I am? And I thought, No, so you've got to give me your name. But when they gave me their name, and when I found them on the list, and I knew who they were, and I ticked them off, they could go past the security guards, past the security guards, past the bodyguards, past the paparazzi, to access all areas. When we realize who Jesus is, is and the authority that he has and that we have his spirit living in us. We have access to all areas. We can access life and life to the full. Jesus empowers us to be fearless and in turn that empowers us to be all that we dream of being because he's gone first, right? He's paved the way. He's mapped out victory before us. Verse 18 says this, for Christ also suffered for sins once for all. The righteous, that's Jesus who was perfect, for the unrighteous, that's people like me, in order to bring you to God. Jesus died on the cross for us. Jesus then also proclaimed to the saints that it is finished. We are saved 
through his death on the cross, he took all of our sin and the shame to the grave so that we can have an unbroken relationship with God. And baptism shows us that we're saved through Jesus. And if you've never been baptized and you'd like to be, um, we're having baptisms on the 18th of June. So let one of our hosting team know and we want to celebrate you and baptize you then. Verse 14 says this, do not fear what they fear and do not be intimidated, but in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. The message paraphrase puts this verse particularly beautifully. It says, through thick and thin, keep your hearts at attention in adoration before Christ your master. We're told to do a cheeky swap. A cheeky swap, replace fear for adoring Jesus. Replace one for the other. Fear for adoration and worship is our weapon. In 2010, 33 Chilean miners got buried alive when a mine collapsed in Chile and they had no viable hope of escape, but they were reported to have sung psalms and hymns to God. How? How? In, in, in the fear, in the midst of despair, in, in, the, in the fear of death by suffocation and starvation, they were able to adore Jesus in their hearts by singing hymns to him. How? Because one minor spoke of Jesus' love for them. And I bet it didn't feel much like he loved them in that moment. But something of the power of that truth enabled them to choose to sing and worship God, to turn their hearts to adore him. Peter encourages us to replace fear with sanctification, adoration. We're told instead of fear, adore Jesus in our hearts. Why? Because something happens when we worship, but both inwardly in our hearts in thanksgiving, but also outwardly in song worship, because something happens when we sing. One Chilean miner described that in that space, trapped, underground, buried, when they sung hymns and prayed to God, the atmosphere in the space lifted. They were blessed. But how does it work? Every Christian has the Holy Spirit living within them. If you have given your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives in you. And it's this spirit that makes us fully alive. When we adore Jesus, the Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit that Jesus is Lord. And his spirit makes us fearless. When we feel fear or intimidation, we're called to swap it for adoration, for worship. Why? Because God wants to set us free. This passage is an invitation. Don't fear. Instead, come and worship me, and my spirit will give you life free of fear. Let's read again. Verse 21. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Who is Jesus? Jesus is king over all the angels, authorities, and powers. He is mighty. There is no one greater than our God. He fights for us. He intercedes for us. And verse 12 says, his ears are attentive to their prayer. Someone here today needs to hear that. God attentively hears your prayer. He sees what you fear, and he knows that he is greater. He is saying there's another way. He's asking us to trust him, even in the unknown. We need to turn our eyes upon Jesus, tear our eyes away from the things that frighten us and focus on the one who loves us. And the weapon to do just that is worship. 
our God conquered death. He's conquered evil. The enemy knows how this story ends. The enemy is defeated. What are we looking at? Are we focused on the end of the story? Or are we stuck in our little chapter of here and now? Jesus is victorious, and therefore, as his children, so are we. Now, does that mean that we're going to succeed in every little thing that we do for Jesus today? No, probably not. But choosing not to let fear crush us comes from the freedom that we receive as we look to the end of the story, not just our little chapter of here and now. As a child, I was terrified of the sea. In fact, I still am. And we were stranded offshore in a blue plastic pedalo boat. And my mom had to come swimming to my rescue. Now, we were 7,000 miles from shore, 70 meters deep in the ocean in shark-infested waters, except I was eight. And so it was probably more like seven meters from the shore and two meters deep and a few guppies in the water. But we abandoned the boat. And we were in the ocean, bobbing up and down. And I clung to my mom, gripped by fear. I couldn't swim. And the only thing that calmed me down was keeping my eyes on the shore. Whenever I looked down into the black sea, I would panic and scream and freak out, and I couldn't swim. But if I lifted my eyes and looked to the shore, I could swim. Ultimately, Jesus is victorious. We are victorious in Christ. When we truly understand that, it gives us the strength to be fearless in all the chapters that lie ahead. We need to lift our eyes out of our current chapter and look at the end of the story. And the way that we do that is worship. Or as Peter puts it today, Adoring Jesus in our hearts. For me, I really encountered the truth of this about three, four years ago. I went into hospital, and I was in a lot of pain. And as I lay there in the hospital bed, I asked my mom to put my earphones in. And so I listened, and I pressed play on this worship playlist. And as I lay there with my eyes closed, I just turned my heart to adore Jesus in the pain. I fell asleep. But when I woke up, my earphones had been taken out. And right in front of me, all I could see were these giant green eyes. And this voice saying, Katie, Katie. It was my dad, nose to nose with me, trying to wake me up gently because the doctors had arrived to see me. I was so shocked at the nearness of his proximity that I nearly fell out of the hospital bed. When we look to Jesus in worship, he is looking right back at us. Not in a creepy fall out of the hospital bed kind of way, but he is nose to nose with us, closer than our breath. He is with us in our situations every step of the way. And worship helps us open our eyes to see just how close he is. Verse 12 for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. In Disney's Aladdin, um, Aladdin is, 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 is balanced precariously on his magic carpet, hovering from the ground, and, and, and he's in a palace, and, and the starry sky is above him on the balcony, and Princess Jasmine is there, and, and he invites her to go on his, on his magic carpet ride with him, and he reaches out to her and says, do you trust me? And when she says yes, he takes her hand, pulls her on board, and they fly away to a whole new world, a whole new world of excitement and opportunity. Jesus is saying to us, do you trust me? When we worship God, even in our fears, it enables us enables him to show us that there is a whole new world 
a whole new world of opportunity, free of fear in spite of our circumstances, life and life to the full. To finish, there is a beautiful story. Um, it was written in the 1600s, and it's called Pilgrim's Progress. And it's about a Christian called Christian. And he goes on a journey. He goes on a journey from the city of destruction to the city of heaven. And this story is an allegory. It's a picture of the Christian life, the journey from destruction to heaven to be with Jesus. And Christian gets lost. Christian gets lost on his journey and ends up in a castle, a castle full of fear and troubles. And he's thrown into a dungeon where he's locked in and a giant beats him up. And he's in this place of fear and hopelessness. And then one day he wakes up and he says, what a fool I have been. I have this key called promise that rests upon my heart. Perhaps this key will open the door of the dungeon that imprisons me. So he takes his key. He slips it into the lock. It fits. It turns. And the door flies open. He enters into the corridor where he reaches another door. And he thinks, I wonder if this key called promise will fit in this lock too. So he takes the key and slips it into the lock. It fits. It turns and the door flies open. Then he runs out into the court courtyard and all that is before him are some huge black gates barred shut by this massive padlock. And he says, I wonder if this key called promise will open this lock too. So he takes the key, he shoves it into the lock and turns it with all of his might and with a clunk and with a crunch those gates fly open and Christian is free to continue on his journey into all that God has for him. And that, if you like, is what we have. We have God's word full of his wonderful promises but we need to take them and apply them to our fears so that we can be free. And one of the ways in which we turn that lock, even when it's really hard, is worship. Amen? Shall we stand? Let's pray together. Lord, thank you that we are no longer slaves to fear. Thank you that you empower us to live in freedom. And we pray today that you would release that truth in this place. Come Holy Spirit, we wait for you.